Excellent. Okay. Well, welcome everyone. I am so happy to have you here and I am over the moon excited to have Lisa here. She is just an incredible resource, fountain of knowledge, fellow Fredericktonian, which is very nice, and a mom who gets it and just has a passion for keeping kids safe, for keeping everybody safe, and really having so much impact on the way that we are able to understand and deal with safety around water and everything that kind of has to do with that to keep our little ones safe. Um, and not even our little ones, everybody, right? So right. I am really, really excited and happy to have her here. Lisa is going to give some incredible information all about the things you need to know this summer to be able to stay safe near the water. Now this is, correct me if I'm wrong, pools, lakes, the whole deal, literally anywhere there is a body of water. Um, last fall, which I can't believe it's been that long already, I know, I know. we discussed bathtub safety and all kinds of different other things, but this is an awesome, awesome presentation, and I'm just so grateful to have you. So Lisa, I'm going to turn it over to you to introduce yourself maybe a little bit better than I did, but oh, I am you, Lara. so excited. Thank you. Thank, I'm excited to be here. We had such a great conversation in October and such great feedback that it was wonderful to be welcomed so warmly back again with an opportunity to share some information. And Yes, I'll go through some statistics and, and we're going to be just having some really great heart to heart conversations about the things you can do to keep your kids and your family safe in, on and around the water. So uh, first and foremost, Lara already introduced me to some extent, um, Lisa Hansen Willett. I am a wife, I'm a mother of two teens now, uh, 14 and 17, which bring a whole new gamut to safety in terms of risk, risks and things of that nature. Um, I also have three cats and one dog. So our, our house theme seems to be these days welcome to our zoo so i'm sure many of you can relate to that uh but here we are and the mid of you know in the midst of all of this uh we still juggle our jobs and still juggle all kinds of things um, as we do as as wives and mothers so um and we do it well so here we are. I uh, started in, uh, just to give you a little bit of background about me, I started uh, with water safety and drowning prevention back in the mid 80s. And so, uh, you know, lifeguarded, did a number of different things um, in and around the aquatics, I know around various aquatic facilities um, for the first few years going through grad school. And then, you know, I hung up that suit and said I was all done. Well, Drowning prevention wasn't done with me. And so I came back just over 10 years ago and I've been working, first worked with the Drowning Prevention Coalition uh, from 2007 until this past January when it amalgamated with the Drowning Prevention Research Center. And what's really neat about that is that the DPRC is the one who collects the data on fatal drownings. Now, this is really cool. Now, as, as a researcher, I get very excited about this because they've been collecting data on fatal drownings and working in conjunction with coroners and medical examiners across Canada for the last 25 years. And in Canada, because of that relationship, and that relationship is ongoing, by the way, we have some of the greatest fatality data on, on drowning anywhere in the world, which is really super cool. So, and, and the next step in that, of course, is developing a new database looking at non-fatal drowning. And I'll get into that a little bit later, but it's really cool to have those statistics and to know that we can go back because all that data drives us forward. So we're not, you know, there's all kinds of things out there that we could be focusing on, but we want to really hit those hot topics, right? Those, those hot spots of, of information, those key target areas. And so that's what I'll talk to you about today so that you can hit some of those in your own house and when you're out and about. So I'm going to share my screen. Let's hope that this is going to be successful. Ta-da, are we here? Lara, do you see my screen? I see it. I'm just going to make sure that it's going to pop up here on Facebook as well. <laughs> <laughs> Good idea. Technology has a mind of its own sometimes. That it does. Also, Stephanie says hi. Oh, hello, Stephanie. <laughs> I have the comments up here as well. So. Oh, I love it. I absolutely love it. I'm so <laughs> glad she's able to join us as a new mom. So I exciting. Know. All right. So the, I just titled this drowning, child drowning prevention, what you need to know for summertime 
safety and fun. And we're often, you know, as moms were packing these bags, be it a diaper bag, because we're off to go wherever it is we need to go. We need our sunscreen and our, you know, we need our sun hats and maybe an umbrella and our blankets and our towels and all those kinds of good things. We also need to pack some knowledge up with us and an awareness when we, when we move forward. There's an expression uh, in, in aquatics, those of us who have lifeguarded once a lifeguard always a lifeguard. And there's no way any of us can sit there, whether we're certified or not. We can't sit there in a, around a pool or at a beach and calmly relax. We're constantly on guard. We're constantly looking for those things. And I, I don't need to be as intense as all of us still sitting there scanning everything, but just to keep an awareness about you um, in terms of what's happening, not only with your own kids, but things can happen around us, right? That impact our safe little bubble right there. And we'll talk about bubbles um, because we have been for so long. All right, let me just uh, see if we can just switch the screen. There we go. So I'm going to be talking to you today from a national perspective. I'm going to bring it down to the Maritimes, talk some about Ontario as well, because I know some people are joining us from Ontario. Uh, so welcome to everyone today. And we're going to start off with a few statistics so that you know that I'm not just making this stuff up. Um, and so you have access to this information. It's all free online. If you go to lifesaving.ca and go under publications, you can find the drowning reports. And so I'm just drawing this information from the National Drowning Report, which I'm going to show you in a couple slides time. But this one's about the maritime. So I've circled it here and I've, I've tried to highlight some of those key pieces. So if we think about drowning that happens in the maritime, most of it's taking place between May and October not real, sorry, May and September. That's not really surprising to us because we have a relatively short season, right? And so we know that we're waiting for things to warm up. And unfortunately, right across the country, May long weekend sort of kicks all that off, unfortunately. And so who's drowning? Here in the Maritimes, we're looking at nine out of 10 are most likely to be male. And when I'm talking about drowning now, I'm talking about fatal drowning. And, and I'll, I'll explain what non-fatal is in a little while. And those age groups most at risk here in the Maritimes be 35 to 49 years old, and then 50 plus. And so there's a few things going on there. We'll be talking about that later. Where are the drownings happening? And you have almost half of them happening in the ocean. And we know that the ocean creates, you know, it's a beautiful spot to be, but we've got rip currents. Um, we have uh, abrupt drop, drop offs in any body of water. We have lots of visitors who aren't really aware of the ocean and, and the dangers that it can impose. And of course, wind carries with it a lot of different uh, impacts on the water and how we react around the water and can read the waves. Some of us are able to read the waves, some are not. We want to watch those balance points with our little ones, but again, we'll talk about that in a moment. 100% of all fatal drownings for children under the age of five come back to distracted parenting or a, a lack of supervision. And I want to clarify as we go through this, um, no one is putting blame on anyone. Parents get busy. You heard, you know, here in my house, there's three cats, two kids, one dog, one husband, lots going on. And anybody can get hurt at any given time. I don't intend for it to happen, nor does my husband, but things do happen. Accidents do happen. So there's no blame game here today. We're just going to talk about the different things and pieces that you need to be aware of as we go. But just, just as we talked about um, in October, Lara, with bathtub safety, things can happen really quickly. You turn around and, and a child can slip under the water. The same thing holds true. Pools, um, kids just kind of sink. You've got, you know, drop-offs or even off balance with sand being uneven in the open water. Any number of things can happen and you get distracted. So what's happening? If people are drowning um, while they're swimming, almost half of them have had alcohol in their system. And we, we'll talk about that today too. And just over, just over a quarter of them have been swimming alone. And so we have, um, with, through the Life Saving Society, the swim with the buddy. You never want to go anywhere alone around the water. You need to let somebody know where you're going, have somebody with you, use the buddy system. You can't breathe underwater. And we often think that it's just such a, a natural place to be, such a relaxing place to be. There are dangers with it. And as long as we're aware of those dangers and we, we act accordingly and we plan accordingly, we should be fine. So what were people doing when they drowned in the Maritimes? Some kind of an aquatic activity, 
Uh, you have 42% were, were boating, and then you have some non-aquatic too. And so we talk, we talk non-aquatic, it could very well be unintentional falls in the water, which means they didn't intend to be in the water. They may have been walking along a shoreline and went in to help somebody. They may have been in a dock and fell off. Any number of things can, can be defined in that way. So all kinds of information there. There's more than that for the Maritime Report. Check out lifesaving.ca under the publications and you can have that full report. Moving on, taking a look at Ontario, things are a little bit different. You don't see the ocean here, right? And so you're looking at uh, lakes making up almost half of those uh, drownings in terms of location, rivers about one fifth. Here, here's an interesting piece, and I, I didn't point this out uh, in the last slide, but it was there as well. And you'll see it in the, the National Drowning Report in the next slide. And that is fewer than 1% of drownings occur in supervised settings. And we're going, to, we're going to clarify what that is. This is a lifeguarded supervised setting, fewer than 1%. So if you're in the, within the buoy lines or within the flags or in a pool with, with lifeguards on board, you, you've got the added layer of protection. You're still watching your own kids because, well, anyone up in a chair on a deck or on, on the beach, simply they have to scan a large area. So we always wanna watch our own kids and what they're doing and where they're going. Uh, but they actually provide that extra safety net, which is of, of benefit and the reaction time helps in terms of survival. So we're not looking at fatal drownings. In Ontario, we've got about 92% uh, supervision was absent or distracted when it came to uh, fatal child dr children drowning, uh, child drownings. My land, the tongue's not rolling tonight. Uh, young adults, we sh they showed up in the last slide as well. And so 93% not wearing a life jacket. We're really going to hit home tonight about the importance of wearing a properly fitted PFD, personal flotation device, or life jacket. And I can define the difference between those. And if I don't, Lara, please remind me to define the difference uh, because they do slightly different things and they're both beneficial. And as long as you got one near nearby, well, there's benefit to it. Again, most people were doing an aquatic activity when it happened. You've got about one fifth for boating and 18% for non-aquatic. So, and last but not least, you've got May to September again as, as those hot time, uh, hot time zones in which these occur. So when you look up the national reports, or you look up the provincial reports or the regional report, as in the case of the Maritimes or the territories, they look like this. They're, they're just two pagers. There's a, there's a full national report as well that you can access. But here's the one from 2020, and it, it has great infographics on it um, to be used. These get updated. Uh, we have more that will be coming out this year, though some are limited just because of a limited availability of information with corners and all this happening with the pandemic. But you'll see nationally, you still have 66% of all fatalities happening between May and September, fewer than 1% of drownings taking place in, in lifeguarded supervised settings. You'll see those bathtub statistics there. And the ocean overall nationally is only 7%, whereas it was considerably higher here in the Maritimes for obvious reasons. So you're always looking at different uh, places and spaces and communities in particular. So if I think and look and look back to the work that I'm doing with the Canadian Drowning Prevention Coalition, yes, it's a national coalition, but we work with community-based coalitions as well, who use these reports to guide them in terms of what they should be focusing on in their own communities. And they'll have additional information, right? The, the little itty bitty details that we may not have. So if we're looking at a place like Fredericton and we're looking at our beautiful um, Willistook River or St. John River, and then we have all kinds of beautiful walking trails and we have a beautiful walking bridge, but there's no life-saving devices anywhere. And if you take a look in the summer, you see boaters out, no life jacket, no life jackets on kids. We have, you know, there can be choppy water. Um, there can be currents taking place in the river year round actually. So we never want to trust the ice necessarily because it weekends underneath, but we'll talk about ice right now. We've gotten rid of it, right? So there's all kinds of considerations in individual communities. And so I'll put in a plug right now that if this is something that you're interested in starting or being part of in your own community, you can always reach out to me and we can have a conversation because not all communities have them yet. Some are just establishing and we really want to get that rolling because we know for a fact that for as much research as we do and as much information as we share, the real work happens on the front lines. So uh, we fully acknowledge that and, and we appreciate it greatly because we work together as a team.
So let's take a look at our little uh, our, our snapshot for summer. How do you get ready for summer? We're going to look at backyard pools. We're going to look at open water. And we're going to look a little bit at recreational boating. And so you'll see in these three pictures, we have a backyard pool. We already have a big hazard right in the middle of that pool. We've got a nice, colorful, happy ball that's just screaming, somebody come touch me or grab me, which of course, pardon me, <laughs> I'm just going to mute myself. I have a tickle and I think it has everything to do my seasonal allergies because I've been working and, and my kids have been schooling here at home, so we don't go anywhere. Uh, but allergies just find me anywhere. Um, if we're looking at open water, we have uh, a child here been fishing with the parent. Parents taking a step back, take the photo. Wonderful. And he's so cute, isn't he? And he's around the water. He may not be in the water. He may not be on the water, but he is around the water. And for that reason, he could easily slip and fall. He could be slipping and falling and yes, the parent may be there. The water may be deeper than he can stand or before the parent gets there, or he may accidentally hit his head on one of the rocks that are there. There's all kinds of possibility. So even when we are around the water, especially if we have more than one kid, right? We only have two hands and, and young children should be within arm's reach. Literally, they move quickly, right? For those of us who have toddlers, I will never forget that in a million years. They move fast. So we always want to keep uh, within arm's reach. And, and those PFDs and life jackets are very helpful. Even for us, if we're managing kids and reflecting back on years of instructing in a pool setting and having instructors take their four or five-year-olds uh, into the deep end, all the kids have PFDs on or life jackets on, but they think it's funny to climb on top of the instructor. The instructor's stuck underneath. These little guys and gals get very, very strong in the water, especially when they think they're being silly or especially when they're frightened. So we always want to be aware of that. So that's why you'll see your swimming instructor in with a life-saving device of some kind for their own safety and protection. And if you see this picture with recreational boating, everyone's wearing a PFD. So I talked about PFDs, personal flotation devices. They're the pieces that come on and they just fit like a vest and then they clip. So you're gonna notice, especially with the picture in the middle, he's got lots of flotation in the front of his body, some behind his neck and a little bit at the top and the upper part of his back. And what that does is it's gonna keep him up. It won't necessarily flip him over. There's not a, an, an abundance of flotation or buoyancy in the front, but it will certainly keep him up. A life jacket is one of those things where you have a big thick piece behind your neck and it's only coming in front of your body and they're really, really thick and bulky and they're not as comfortable to wear. But if you were to land on your, on your face, uh, on your tummy in the water, all that flotation wants to be in the top. So what happens? It's gonna flip you over. So, and of course, because it's behind your neck, you're coming back to keep that airway open. So there's different benefits, but we wanna be able to be able to move. So that's why people like the PFDs. Uh, you'll also find that if you're looking for a Transport Canada approved PFD, which is very important, you won't find one for children under 20 pounds. And I believe that's eight kilos, Lara, somewhere thereabouts. Yeah, more or less. So you're not gonna find that. It's, it's really hard for Transport Canada to do, but it is something that the Canadian Drowning Prevention Plan talks about and is really uh, recommending happen. Even, you know, we can, find all kinds of things, but we can't find that. But the point is to make sure that you have a PFD on your child, especially if you're in a boat. All right, let's look at backyard pool safety. So I divided this up. We've got some safety items to consider and we have some spring safety checklists, okay? Um, and these are not complete. These are just sort of a highlighted kind of piece. You can find lots of information in terms of backyard pool checklists on the Life Saving Society websites. Life Saving Society Ontario has a really great one, a full one, if you want to do your own, you know, your own audit of your own backyard or inspection, or you can have somebody from the Life Saving Society come in and do an audit. They do that in, in professional uh, pools and professional facilities. And it's certainly a service that in some life-saving branches across the country uh, is offered to backyard pool owners as well. So if you're looking at safety items, the first thing you want to think about for your backyard pools is whether or not it's in compliance with legislation. Legislation sort of loosey-goosey uh, across this country. It's not consistent. And here in New Brunswick, we don't have legislation uh, for backyard pools. And so, which is, which is sad. 
Some municipalities do have legislation. So in the city of Fredericton, you must have fencing around your pool, but outside the city limits, you don't. So of course that's gonna pose a risk. Um, and I will mention that as a pool owner, uh, you are liable if somebody gets into your pool. And so that is, that's a huge liability. Even if they sneak in at night, a bunch of teens, like I said earlier, right? I just have a whole different level, <laughs> a, whole, a whole new list of things to worry about. Um, but my kids have heard this water safety talk many, many times, so they don't even want to get into it with me. Um, so compliance with legislation, take a look at what it is uh, that's needed in your province, uh, in your municipality, what are the bylaws that are required, make sure you're in compliance, uh, because that also impacts your insurance as well. So four-sided locking fence is ideal. Many pools have fences, but it's attached with the house being one of those sides. Well, as soon as you have a fence, uh, your house is one of those sides, that means there's most likely a door. One of the moms who uh, volunteers with the Canadian Drowning Prevention Coalition unfortunately lost her four-year-old son. Uh, similar scenario, the, the house was one side of that fence, but there were two doors uh, in, through which uh, one would have to gain access. And there were locks way up high on those doors. And the child was adamant he was going to get in the backyard to fill a water balloon. And when uh, parents' backs were turned, he took a toy sword, pushed up on the lock, pushed up on the next lock, gained entrance. And by the time they went to look for him, it doesn't take very long. They're not going to think about going out there, right? He's in the house. It was unfortunately too late. So her message is to always be aware. And again, no blame game here. Uh, many kids, lots of things going on. I believe she may, she may have been off bathing one child, the, the, the dad somewhere else. So things happen. But using that the, the house as one side of the fence is not the safest option. Four-sided uh, locking fence is the best. Alarms and cameras are, are all over the place now. Uh, many are, are reasonably priced. It could be one, it could be more. Some will feed into your phone. Take a look at the technology around you. See what's available, what's in your, your budget, uh, what may be available. There's even wristbands that can be worn um, that feed in and talk to your phone and give you an alarm. If, if a child or a person has, is below the surface for a longer period of time than, than you think they would be, there's a, a timer or something along those. I don't have one in a, as a hands-on learner. I'd need to go through it um, to, to understand it. But there are options out there and it's kind of neat to look at them. Some of them are listed in the Canadian Drowning Prevention Plan. If you gain access to the seventh edition, again, it's all free. If you, you look that up on CD pcoalition.ca under publications and you'll gain access to the seventh edition and so there's a section there on technology and it talks about all the many different things that are out there so look at lighting as well as a safety item so a lot of people like to swim at night if you're swimming in the dark that's rather dangerous but even during the day um, if you if it's raining really hard and you can't see the bottom of your deep end, many of the public pools will have a black dot in the middle of their deep end. And if you've ever wondered what that's for, that's for visibility. So if you can't see that black dot clearly, you're not going to be able to see a body in the bottom of the pool. And, and I'm not mincing words there. That's just that's just the way it is. So you can do the same thing in your own pool, paint a dot in the bottom, take a look, see what you can see, make sure that there's lots of light around. And if you do have evening swimming, lots of light shining on that water so you can see it at all times. Uh, Life-saving devices in and around, much of the legislation would require you to have a shepherd's hook, uh, life-saving uh, a ring buoy, and uh, maybe life jackets around, you could use noodles, all kinds of things that can be around. I will mention that a kickboard or a flutterboard is not a life-saving device. They're not very reliable and they fly all over the place. But if you need something as a reaching device and they're close by, you just grab a hold of that thing. And we can talk about a, a little bit about that too. Life jackets and PFDs having various sizes around your backyard pool. You never know who's going to visit. These days you probably should considering the pandemic, but that aside, this will hopefully not last forever and we'll be back in business. So various sizes, you can pick them up in different places. Take a good look at them. We'll talk about the, the spring safety checklist um, in a minute. First aid kit and telephone. Make sure that you've got one with you each. So you've got the telephone there, something that has, uh, if it's not, we don't use landlines per se anymore, but if you do have one that has a portable option, make sure that you're going to have a clear signal. The same thing with your cell phone. 
I personally have, I don't have it with me here in my office right now, but I have a, a life proof case that I put on it so that it is waterproof. I'm around water and sand often and I drop things just happens. Uh, and I have already lost one phone. Mind you, I was on the job at the time and, and had to go in for a rescue, but discovered my phone in my pocket too little too late. And phones don't like chlorine either, just saying. So make sure that that is there and available to you. The faster you can contact EMS, the better. Knowing what and what to say, how to say it, keeping your wits about you to give them detail, and we're going to talk about the importance of CPR and first aid. The faster you can get it started, the better. We'll talk about that in a minute. Toy storage goes back to this photo. We've got that nice floating colorful ball. Child wants to lean over and grab that and plop. They just plop right in. And you may not even hear that happen. They may even slide in and you may not hear it happen. Um, for years, this, this I've seen this firsthand where a child could be standing up and then just lose their balance and just sit on the bottom. And they're just looking up at you, blink, blink, blink. But if you don't see them, that blink, blink, blink can, can stop rather quickly. So you want to get them. So toy storage, make sure your toys are put away. Make sure that they're locked up. You don't want to uh, make sure everything's just, just tidied up. You don't want anything that can create a hazard or a potential, you know, something that's just going to um, encourage uh, kids to go and, and do something else, okay, that they shouldn't be doing in and around the water. And you want a safeguard area, and I'll explain what that is. So a safeguard area for a designated parent supervisor. Now, when I grew up and we had a backyard pool, everyone would just go hang out and tan. Nobody worried about watching anybody else. And, you know, we may even have a drink in hand. Well, obviously not the children, but it could be pops, could be chips, could be all kinds of things happening around that pool. But no one's really watching the pool. No one's really watching the kids or is a designated supervisor. That's what we're recommending now. And so this is part of the Canadian Drowning Prevention Plan. It's been mentioned many times, but it is absolutely essential. And you need to have that designated parent who's not gonna be on their phone, not looking, uh, reading a book or talking to a parent or preparing food or passing food or answering questions. Your sole purpose is to stand and watch the pool and you're watching under the water and you're watching the top of the water. And when your, your shift is done, or if you're sharing that responsibility with another parent, the other parent comes over, they start looking and say, okay, I'm watching everything. And then you can leave your shift, much and similar to what lifeguards do, but you're providing that safety net I referenced earlier. And it's very, very important. So what can you do in the spring and your safety checklist? Well, you wanna check your locks because we know that ice and snow and pressure on gates can change that. You can change, you know, it can change the hinges. It can change if it's, it's an automatic latching mechanism. That can change too, especially if there's been pressure on that gate. Uh, we know that firsthand here and I'm always checking the gates and making sure if there's multiple gates, there's multiple locks and those need to be locked up at all times unless you're using that, that space. We wanna make sure that that space is clear. So if you do need EMS to arrive, you can just open that gate and, and they can have free access, uh, easy access to where they need to be. But make sure that your fencing is secure. Like I said, you wanna check gates, you wanna check all the uh, balusters, you wanna check to make sure that nothing's been cut, nothing's been damaged, an animal hasn't dug a hole underneath that a small child could get through. Like all those kinds of things take a real, you want that locked up tight. Uh, tables and chairs, you want to make sure they're secure. You've probably seen pictures on Facebook, those videos where kids stack things. And I was a climber as a kid. So, and, I, and, and my parents would probably kill me. My mother would laugh. But I'm going to share with you a story. So I was little and uh, I, my father was babysitting me. And I decided, you know, I was going to climb something. I wanted to touch the wheeling, the ceiling. What did I do? I took my child chair and put it up on top of the dining room table, climbed up on the dining room table chair, gained access to the table top, stood on top of my own, or was in the process, sorry, was in the process of getting up onto my child chair when my mother walked in, right? I'm not the only one. There's probably climbers right here and you can all laugh at yourselves now, but children still do this kind of thing. So. They can take those patio chairs, they can take the tables, they can do just about anything, stack and gain access. So even if you have an above ground pool, which is four feet high, you can have additional 
fencing around the top of it. You could secure, make sure that those ladders are locked up to that fence so they can't, or locked up in an area that they can't gain access or move them. When a kid wants to get somewhere, they will figure out a way. And there is a, a wonderful video, scary, but wonderful nonetheless, where there's portable stairs that collapse in. Okay, and so they go flat. And the concept is that the child can't gain access to the pool. And so there's a little talk, wasn't very old. You can probably Google, I wish I, I knew the name of it. Shimmied up this thing. No problem at all in bare feet. Bare feet are sticky, but shimmied right to the top and then mom grabbed them. So just to prove the point that it's not 100% safe. So secure tables and chairs, please. Secure the toy boxes, secure anything else that a child could use to leverage to gain access to that water. Check your life saving devices and your life jackets, especially if your PFDs, some of the PFDs and life jackets get stored in boxes outside in the winter, that's gonna wear and tear on the fabric. Uh, so make sure that, you know, if you're going to put those on, you don't have some weak part in the bottom where it's frayed and then the, the layers, because it's put into layers inside and you don't want those slipping out. That's entirely ineffective, kind of lopsided, not going to really work. Life-saving devices, make sure nothing is rusted and falling apart, especially if there's plastic pieces that wear and tear in the winter. We don't always have space inside our homes where it's warm and insulated to secure them. Quite often, a lot of the stuff ends up in a shed, under a deck, um, where it's secured, or even under a tarp in some cases, right? But we need to make sure that it's all checked and safe. So check your toys over. The same thing holds there. Inflatables. I don't like inflatables. Ask the lifer. They don't like inflatables. Inflatables deflate. So water wings, forget them. Just forget them right now. Don't even bother, they're not a life-saving device. You inflate them, you're putting them on the arms, the kids jump in and boom, they come right up. Uh, ensure that your child is wearing a properly fitted PFD or a properly fitted belt, depending upon their age. You wanna make sure that they can walk, like they can move around freely and ideally be able to move their bodies. A lot of kids that are straight up and down when they, they transition from these devices that hold them straight up and down, they can't transition and so their bodies don't work to elongate for swimming lessons but i won't get into those details even though i could uh check your toys so update your first aid kit check to see what may have been wear and tear what things may be expired your burn creams or anything along those lines band-aids may be dried up alcohol swabs may be dried up there's a number of things that can happen make sure that that's up to date update your cpr training that is something that can happen every year it doesn't take very long and it truly can save a life uh, one of the recommendations you'll find in the canadian drowning prevention plan is that the coalition is recommending that everyone uh, be mandated to take CPR training and research every time you uh, renew your license or take your license for the first time. Uh, many country, other countries around the world do it. Germany is one, and they have found that that is highly beneficial in terms of first response on scene. So we know it saves lives. So that's interesting. First aid certification. You can never go wrong with having first aid and CPR. Simple. It's fun to do. It is in it, it just keeps your mind where it needs to be when something happens and it allows you to respond quickly enough so that if you do need the help of uh, nine, you know, 911 or EMS services, it's just going to give you that extra step ahead to help someone and to help them survive. Uh, taking the safeguard program. So I talked about a safeguard area for designated parent supervisor. There's actually a program that's out there. It's called Safeguard, again, offered through Life Saving Society. Just runs you through some really brief ways of, of uh, tips and tricks on how to supervise uh, kids in different settings. So sometimes it's for, for caregivers. It could be for daycare workers. It could be for anyone who's taking care of children. It can be for parents. You name it. Everyone can benefit from doing this and you get what's called an on guard card. I don't have a photo of it here, although there is a photo coming in the eighth edition of the plan coming out in, in early May. And it's just the reminders of what you need to do. And so whoever's wearing the on guard card is on guard. They're responsible. So as, and when I talked earlier about the transition from one parent to another uh, watching the pool, well, the second parent would come over and say, okay, I'm now watching the pool. So they're not looking at each other. We would call that buddy guarding if we're on the job at a pool. We don't want to be doing that. So your second parent is actually looking and that first parent's taking off the card, passing it over, 
one set of, at least one set of eyes is on the water at all times and then they get their break and the other person's wearing that card so it's a really neat reminder and above all else set up a safety plan we have something if you have a backyard pool or you're visiting a backyard pool have a safety plan in place what will you do if x happens what will you do if y happens one of the things that the coalition has done, we, we have a series of technical working groups that focus on key areas. And one of those key areas is supervised settings. And when we started this process, supervised settings meant lifeguarded settings. But it's evolved. Light, supervised settings now includes, it, it can include, you know, outings for canoe trips. It could be any, it could be a school outing to a, a local beach or a local pool, right? It could be any number of things. So they have created a new definition, constantly updating that. But above all else, I said, you need to have a safety plan. And so I think that that's really relevant for all parents to have too. What happens if? Have that plan in place. You're going to have peace of mind if you do that. And in what role that can also include not only the, the equipment that you're going to need, but role, what role can other people play? What happens if you had guests? What, what role do each of them play? All right, let's switch to cottage and open water safety. So the, a lot of this stuff you're going to find is repetitive. Some of it's not. So again, compliance with legislation, if there's any signage and markers. So similar, similar to going to a supervised beach, you have some buoy lines. Well, maybe you have a designated area that you know is safer for children. It's much more shallow. You could have a marker before a drop off. You can mark any number of things. Um, I think in our conversation in October, uh, Liam Boisvert, one of our leaders for the technical working group at the coalition, uh, she, she said that at their family cottage, they have a marker on the beach and the kids are not permitted to pass that marker without two things, a parent and a PFD or life jacket, period. That is the rule. There, is a, there are markers there that you cannot pass this. Not to say as kids get older that they won't try it. We know that we're realists, but we wanna set things up for success. Again, alarms and cameras, lighting, life-saving devices, life jacket, PFDs, various sizes. You never know who's going to visit or what you can use them for. So if you are in a situation where the wind might pick up and, and the kids might be floating away and you need to help get them in, for goodness sake, never go in the water after somebody without having a life-saving device. We use them professionally uh, when lifeguarding. You should do the same thing and try to keep a distance. Um, we were talking more about how to work with um, lay rescuers, we, we would call. So individuals who wouldn't have all the same training as a lifesaver or a lifeguard, but providing that level of understanding, awareness, and safety if you do have to go in after somebody. So life jackets and PFDs are useful for that as well. Throwing, reaching, um, any number of things. So again, first aid kit, telephone, a secure boating area. You don't want boats to be hitting people. Uh, you wanna make sure that they're properly moored, docked, tied, or you know, if a kayak or canoe that they're properly you know, brought up on, on that beach in an area where the kids can't gain access. Uh, safeguard area for a designated parent supervisor. The same holds true. The challenge with open water, it, it's, it's very different than the pool. A pool, you can see the bottom. Open water, that's not going to happen. And so you need to be really aware of where everybody is, what their swimming capabilities are. Because a search, I can, I can tell you firsthand, a searching underwater is not fun. Uh, and there's, there's a lot of different layers to doing that. So now that being said, if you do need to go and help somebody, ensure that you have some kind of a boat or something if the water does go way out that you can access. If you're in a boat, you're much safer being in that boat to try to help someone than you are going out on your own. So the closer you are to the individual, uh, the higher your risk. So taking, and, taking that into consideration when you do your safety plan and anything, there's all kinds of things that float. Um, even a wooden door will float. Uh, so they're not saying that that's ideal, but thinking outside the box, if you're really in a pinch, um, but reaching, throwing, uh, using a boat, using your paddles, whatever, but try to keep a distance if, that, if you're stuck in that situation. What's your spring safety checklist for a cottage and open water safety? So uh, again, locks if they're working, 
you know, there may be an area for the toys, right? So you want to lock those up. Uh, fencing, make sure that if, if that's applicable, that that is secure. Tables and chairs, again, secure. Uh, check your life-saving devices and, and your life jackets. Uh, check your toys, update the first aid kit and your blankets. And I've put blankets here. It should also be near your pool, but particularly with open water, it's cold. And different times of year, it's colder. So I can, speaking from experience out and training uh, water front lifeguards, uh, May, early June with after that runoff, it is freezing. And at the end of summer, early September, I have been out and I have shivered so much in a full body wetsuit that I have lost three pounds in a day. So don't underestimate the cold uh, temperature of the water and blankets are there to help keep people warm and prevent hypothermia, or at least slow the process down until you can get them to safety. Look up hypothermia and remember it when you take your first aid course, please and thank you. Uh, update your CPR and your first aid, always great to have, especially if you're in a remote area. So you need to ensure that you have access, that you have um, telephone service. Know how long it's going to take should you need an ambulance. Uh, it may very well be a volunteer firefighter, uh, uh, firemen and firewomen who come to you because they may be in closer, closer proximity than um, EMS at that point, like an ambulance to get to you, and they will transfer you to the nearest spot. Uh, update the C, take the safeguard program, same thing applies and set up a safety plan. So again, lots of things are repetitive, but it never hurts to repeat. Recreational boating safety. So some of these are repetitive, some of them not so much. The clients with legislation. So boating legislation is, is very clear. One of, the, one of the recommendations that the coalition makes in the drowning prevention plan is that life jackets must be worn by all persons on the boat, on the craft. Why am I emphasizing that? Because the current regulation indicates that the life jacket or PFD, there needs to be at least one on board for an individual, for each individual who's on board. It doesn't say anything about them being properly fitting. It doesn't say anything about them, you know, um, in terms of the condition or where they're stored. I will put a challenge to you. If you're in a safe location, not with your boat, perhaps in a pool, but there, there's actually videos of this. The Canadian um, Safe Boating Council did a video, the Life Jacket Challenge. So if you Google Life Jacket Challenge, they had been working with boaters who weren't 100% sure where they could find their PFDs or life jackets that were on board in a hurry. So they invited them and many participated and they have them in a wave pool. And they have very life jackets and PFDs of various sizes in the water. And they had to see how quickly they could put one on in the water. It is not easy to do at best. Even if you're someone who is trained to do it, it is really hard. And for the most part, you're gonna be wearing some kind of clothing doing it. Sometimes if you have pants or even a, a hoodie or something, because it's colder uh, when you're out in the boat, uh, that's gonna make it heavier in the water trying to find and, and zip something up and get it proper put, put on properly so that it will keep you up. You may not even have that opportunity if you've hit your head or you have to go and, and help someone else. Um, so wear your life jacket. It's really simple to do and it's going to keep you safe. You never know what's going to happen out on the water. Onboard safety equipment, again, it comes back to regulation of what is required, taking your boating safety course and learning all those different ins and outs and refresh every year. Uh, first aid kits, life-saving devices, a communication device, let somebody know where you're going and how long you're going to be so that if you don't return, they know when to start looking and where to start looking. Remote locations make it that much more difficult. A safety plan. And the rules really should apply everywhere, but I've put them here on boating in particular, no alcohol. We don't drink and drive behind the wheel of a car. We shouldn't be doing it behind the wheel of a boat or on a craft. It, in, it impairs our judgment. And alcohol, I shouldn't just say alcohol, it should be substances of any kind. So if you're looking, you know, driving is driving, whether you're behind a, the wheel of a boat or that car, it has the same impact and can have the same damage. Your spring safety checklist for your, you're gonna check over your boat. 
every little square inch of it. You're going to check out your ropes, make sure that they're not frayed or rotting. Uh, take a look at those onboard safety equipment, check it all. Check life saving devices in your life jackets, PFDs, update your first aid kit, update CPR and first aid certifications. Take your safeguard program because even when you're on a boat, you want to stay alert at all times, making sure that everyone is safe. Set up and review your safety plan. And above all, do your weather check. Weathers can change in an instant. And we've seen that here. We know uh, out, the, out on the Willistuck River, the, the St. John River, uh, Grand Lake area, things can change in a heartbeat. If you're looking at Martinique Beach in, in Nova Scotia, uh, Rainbow Haven, uh, any number of beaches in and along the coast, uh, Ontario, well, Lake Ontario for Pete's sake, right? Like things change in an instant. And so you want to ensure that you are ready and you're not going to go out if something's going to uh, come on the horizon. So, um, and weather checks are available through um, Environment Canada. They have a really great app now. And so you can, I just have that on my phone. So if I'm even going out to take the dog for a walk and I want to know what's happening, I just check that really quickly too. You know, no such thing as bad weather when you're walking a dog, just bad clothing. So uh, you always want to check that out. So overall, what are the main themes in all this? So above all, you want to limit access to water and ensure uninterrupted supervision by an adult. So you'll notice I said adult there. If you don't think back to those slides that we looked at, Earlier on, you'll notice the age groups, there was a 15 to what bracket, 24? Let's just skip back really quickly here. Let's see, oh, I'm looking at a different one here. It's 20 to 34, do, 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 20 to 34. There's another for a younger age group. And so they are most likely to get uh, distracted, especially when we look at phone technology and everything that's happening. So uninterrupted supervision by an adult. Lock it up, limit access, uninterrupted vigilance within arm's reach and fitted life jackets. So let's talk a little bit about how to ensure that your PFD is fitting properly, especially for kids, because kids grow all the time. And so every year you're looking at a new side. So you're going to put it on and you can zip it up. Make sure that all buckles are done where they need to be done. If they're too short and they won't buckle anymore, automatically you know that that's going to be too small. It's not working the way it's supposed to work. To ensure that it's not too big, ensure that everything is zipped up and you're going to grab right underneath these arm pads. You're going to pull up if it's coming up and over the ears. That is way too big. All right. So you want to make sure that it's a nice snug fit uh, so that it can't slip off. Okay. Eliminating risk factors is something else you want to consider all summer long. So not wearing a PFD, you saw that that was marked heavily in terms of fatalities. Wear your PFD, especially if you're in a boat. If you're going to be, you know, fishing off the rocks, uh, this is actually a study that's taken place in Australia recently. Uh, rock fishing right along the coast has become one of the more dangerous activities uh, where fatalities are seem to be turning up. Uh, alcohol consumption, anytime you're around the water just leave the alcohol somewhere else uh, or any substance somewhere else. You want to be complete. You want to be vigilant. You want it for yourself and for others. Don't swim or go around in, on, or around water alone. Uh, be aware of weak or non-swimmers. If you're a weak or non-swimmer and you're around water, put a PFD on. Then you can have much more fun. You don't need to worry about safety so much at that point. You can actually just enjoy yourself. Uh, capsizing is another risk in terms of boating and don't do don't go out in the water after dark. You know, if you're in your back air pool, like I said, lots of light there so you can see everything. That's a different story because you can see, but going in the dark, that's just a huge risk. Uh, first aid and CPR training. So you can talk to Lara about that. Uh, Life Saving Society also has uh, first aid and CPR training trainers across the country. And so you can check out uh, their, their sites. Quite often they have courses that are available listed already on their individual branch sites. So you can check those out. Uh, swim to Survive and Learn to Swim programs for everyone. Now I'll, I'll mention Swim to Survive for a moment because it's, it's really a simple concept and survival swimming and basic swim skills are some of the, the most uh, 
simple, but they are life skills that you need. And so for someone to survive, you're learning how to, you're disorienting yourself by rolling or falling into the water, you're treading water for a short period of time, and then you're going to be swimming a distance and coming back. Now that could have be with a life jacket or PFD on or without, ideally it's without, but it just depends upon the age and stage and your swimming capability. But those simple skills, truly do save lives. So if you haven't done that before, haven't taken basic swimming lessons, you don't need all your levels. You just need to know the basics uh, for your own safety. That's what's key. And that is what's supported by research. Uh, safeguard program. Uh, so safely supervise children on, in, or around water. And I have the picture here. I will be my child's lifeguard. I believe that photo was either from uh, last year, the 2020, or perhaps even 2019's uh, National Drowning Prevention Week, which always comes out in mid-July, usually around the third week of July. So watch for that. There'll be lots of social media posts about it. And so those are really great reminders. Um, but again, there's all kinds of different safety aspects that you can do in your own backyard pool, around your own cottage, and in and around the boat. Thanks very much. That is a ton of information, Lara. Tons, but I am here to answer any questions that might come our way. Which there are some. Thank you <laughs> so much, Lisa. Oh my goodness. This is just, it's such a good reminder. It's so timely as well. Such perfect time to be able to kind of talk about this, get this top of mind yes. around here, like in our area in Fredericton yes. or in New Brunswick, in literally any part of Canada. There is water everywhere, and that is not going to be something that you are going to want to say, oh my, really wish I'd have done something about this. This is not one of those things that you want to do, which is why we're talking about this, and it's, I appreciate it so much. I appreciate the invitation. One of the things too, I and I should mention because it, it's relevant to what we're going through right now. Last summer we found with the pandemic, lots of people wanted to go outside. We know that being outside is a safer place to be. Uh, we still need to maintain distance and all those kinds of things that are important for safety. But a lot of people were going to unsupervised areas for, for many reasons, but one of them was to get away from other people, right? You wanted your own space and place. But many times, keep in mind that unsupervised areas also have unsighted dangers that aren't always listed or posted. So rip currents are one, under toes, you've got all drop offs, right? So, so really be aware of where you're going to be um, and keep that in mind. There's a really popular place, and for anyone who is familiar, Char Charlotte County area, um, that people kind of do the jumping off the side of the cliff. And there was, I know, there was a friend of my sister's um, a few years back who jumped and never came back up. Yes. And it was just just such a devastating thing. I mean, he was a very strong swimmer, but who mm -hmm. knows who knows what happened? It just, it well, was and really unfortunate. Yeah. And so with bridge jumping, bridge jumping is one of those things that is extremely dangerous. And what a lot of folks don't understand is that there's dead wood underneath that water. And so you think that you have a depth that's really, really deep, but of course you have dead trees that are floating under. And of course it's like hitting a brick wall. Any number of things can happen. We also see that uh, the higher research suggests that, you know, the higher your capability in terms of swimming, the greater risks you're willing to take. And so um, that's not surprising either, be it for cliff jumping, bridge jumping and other things people are yeah. looking for the adrenaline rush, but it is very, very dangerous. Yeah, for sure. So there was a couple of questions that came in. Um, one of them was, I'm curious to know about kayaking or canoeing with littles. What age is it safe to bring them with us? I have enjoyed kayaking for many years and have a couple little kids. Ah, what are you defining as a little? <laughs> um, <laughs> I know this person in particular, so this is under the age of five. <laughs> under the age of five. You know what? If, if you have a properly fitting life jacket or PFD and you're going in relatively shallow water, that could be a really fun experience. You want to ensure that you're, you're able to manage uh, because kayaks, they flip over. So what, do, what are you going to do, right? And so really look at all those different pieces in terms of your own safety and that of your little, oh, I love that term. Um, I'm gonna, I'll, have to, I'll have to remember that one. So thank you for adding that to my vocabulary. Um, 
think about all those different pieces, especially the safety elements. But again, you know, if you want to introduce your little to that opportunity, uh, as they get bigger, both my kids had kid sized kayaks, and they absolutely love them. They were they were they were a blast. And so you know, they, they weren't with me on mine, but starting out and so we wouldn't go very far and we were in a lake. So I didn't need to worry about under toes. I didn't need to worry about rip currents. I had a very still body of water that was very uh, consistent. And so uh, they had all kinds of exposure. And one ended up doing competing in life-saving sport on, on boards and going in all kinds of different areas as she's gotten older, but. That's cool. Yeah, yeah it's really cool. It's really super cool. The other question was, um, does she, do you have any favorite items, recommendations um, for PDFs or, oh my goodness, PFDs? I do that jackets. all the time. <laughs> For infants or toddlers learning to swim for the first time in a pool? Ooh, ah, PFDs. You know, it's, it's funny. I was, I was talking with a colleague today who is a new grandma. Oh, and that reminds me, we'll talk about boundaries too, won't we, Lara? I think that that's a really good one um, from both, both sides of that, that coin. Um, but she was saying that uh, because we were discussing that there were no Transport Canada approved PFDs for kids under 20 pounds. So what is it? Eight point something kilos? Come on, do your yeah. calculation. Come on, RN. You're going to be here. faster at this than me. Pop quiz, right? No pressure. Uh, so there, there's 9.09. So 9.1 9 pounds. <laughs> there we go. 9.1. Uh, 9.1 kilos uh, transitions to 20 pounds. So you're not going to find one that's Transportation Canada approved, but it's not to say that there aren't good ones out there. So some things to keep in mind, the color. So if you're... It, it, there's nothing that beats yellow, orange, and red. You want it to be super bright because anything that's white or dark colored or even something that can be, you know, it looks like a reflection on the water because if that child is left alone because of an incident, you want to be able to spot them quickly or you want somebody else to be able to spot them quickly and go after them. So color is going to be really key. The fit is really important. Uh, my colleague actually prefers uh, Silas or Salus, sorry, S A. LUS is one of um, the manufacturing companies. And so uh, they produce a lot of uh, life jackets, or sorry, PFDs specifically for kayaking. So you'll see that um, where to find, I don't know, this is actually a conversation we had this afternoon in advance of this, this talk tonight. Um, just some really neat tips and tricks that she shared because we all have all kinds of them, right? And, and you know, I only have you know, the information from my various bubbles that I've coll collided over the years. Uh, but I learned so much more every day, which makes my my job really fun. So does that answer the question? So what you, should you be looking for in the, in the type and if there's any particular brands? Yeah, um, it, was, it was mostly just around kind of infants and toddlers learning to swim for the first time. So, okay. um, you yeah, know, I've got more to add to that. Okay, so let's roll up the sleeves for this one. I mentioned no water wings. Uh, no puddle jumpers. Oh, nothing with the tubes that go around a child's body. If you, I don't know if they're still even available, but they look like a little vest that you slide on. There's a tube around them, keeps them up this way. Well, if they turn upside down, guess where it keeps them? Upside down. Um, and so if you think about swimming uh, when you're older, okay, so when, the, when you're little gets older, in order to float or to glide effectively, they need to elongate their body which means staying on top of the surface. So if you're using something to help encourage them to swim and move in the water, you don't always want them straight up and down because that's defeating the purpose. And so what often happens when kids do that transition, they do the tuck motion. So their upper body's like this, and yet they stay in that little feet. I can't do this on a video. If I'm in person, I can crunch myself up because I'm very expressive, as you can tell. But they crunch up their legs underneath them and then their butt comes up. So they have this little pop up and that's really indicative of them not elongating their body or having had that training, that physical memory to do that from a young age. So if you have them in something, especially a PFD, they can stretch out their body. They can stretch it on their back. They can stretch it on their front. You can say, you know, come touch my fingers and they stretch themselves out towards you because the more that they elongate that body, the, the younger that they are, the better off they're going to be. They can blow their bubbles through mouth, through nose. They can have all kinds of fun. And for the, for the tip to get the bubbles through the nose, just have them hum. 
hum a, hum a song because when the air comes out, the water can't go in. So there's all kinds of fun little tips and tricks and have fun with your littles in the water this summer. Keep them safe, but it is such a joy because there's nothing that a kid loves more than playing and splashing and having fun. So, so, so true. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I love it. So I have been a fish my whole life, but <laughs> I love the water. I'm, I just need to get my son. This is one of the things is, you know, I know um, and we're going to talk just in a second here about kind of grandparents and yeah. welcome Lacey. But um, one of the things like my dad has a pool and it makes me super nervous because, you know, we didn't have one growing up. We didn't have we weren't around them a whole bunch. There is not a lot of safety measures in place. They are also outside of city limits. So it does make me very nervous knowing that that is sure. there and that you know, I'm not going to be able to watch him at all times myself. So what would you think, like when you, you had mentioned boundaries and stuff, um, I'd love to know a little bit about how to kind of navigate that situation. Sure. And it can go, it can go from two perspectives, right? So parent to grandparent, grandparent to, to new parent or to, you know, cause our parents still see us as kids, even though I'm almost 50 years old, my parents still see me as, as a kid. Um, <laughs> Even though I have teens, they still see me as a kid. Anyway, no attention there. So we all live through it. Um, have your safety plan and discuss it with, with the grands and, and, and have them have input back and forth, right? Because the flip side, and, and I'll talk more about a, a parent going to, to an area where they're, where they're unsure, because that's not even just going to be grandparents' house. It could be a friend's house. It could be anywhere, right? Like even to a campground where things aren't going to be above board, depending upon if legislation's in place or not, right. or, or if there is any legislation. But uh, my colleague this afternoon had pointed out that, that you know, something to keep in mind is as grandparents come in into the play, uh, new parents may come and think this is a break or they need a break. I needed a break when my kids were young. I need a break now that my kids are a teen and we're all locked up, right? But um, we don't want to bring in the alcohol or the books or whatever. When the kids are around the pool, everyone has a role to play. So it comes back to that safeguard program, right? Who's the designated at any given time? And so you can share that role around and make sure that your communication is really clear, whether it is at a pool or at a cottage, because quite often our parents are the ones who are owning the cottages. We're still too young and poor to own them, uh, but we may have access to them. And so have those designated points. Again, it comes back to that safety plan and that open dialogue that's going to be important. What do you do when you go to a place? Um, you know, and I can just think about my own neighborhood, right? And nothing against my neighbors. I love my neighbors. love my neighborhood. But we're outside of the city limits. And so a lot of people have pools and there's not going to be any fences. And so um, an above ground pool, it's harder for a child to get up. But we talked about how they can do that really easy and they can shimmy if they want in somewhere, they're going to find out. Or if, they're, if there's a team of two, then you're really in trouble. Okay. So fencing is the, the key piece in all of that. You want to restrict access at all times. One of the things you could do if, if you're into technology, you could get one of the wristbands that go on I me. Mean, you can get watches for kids with GPS sensors in them now for the same price as a, as a watch. Uh, but you can do, I don't know what they go for, but you can have a, a wristband and it actually sends a message or a signal and an alarm to your phone. So um, if there's any entrance into water, then it's going to sound the alarm. You can take a look. There's all kinds of products and there's some of them discussed in the seventh edition of the plan. I don't remember them offhand, but they're written down. And I told you where to find it. So that's always good. Um, you, you really do want to have that dialogue and you want to ensure that no matter what, there has to be an, uh, like a, a concrete rule that the, your child does not go in the water, one, without a parent within arm's reach and two, without a PFDR life jacket on, period. Like that, this just, there's just some pieces that are just uh, non-negotiable and there needs to be an understanding about that. Uh, kids can, can slip under, it happens so fast. And uh, even, even as I, I can still picture um, some of the kids that I've pulled out over the years and they might be just right under my feet. I could be on the deck and looking down and boom, they were just there and I'm purposely positioned by the drop off, right? Um, and I flatten myself on the deck, reach down and grab and pull them out. But if you're not right there, you're not, you're not necessarily going to get there quick enough. So that's why these technology pieces are really kind of interesting and coming into play now. 
um, whereas we didn't have those for many, many years. So, uh, but alarms on gates, um, any, anything in particular that you're thinking of, Lara, and then we can talk through it because we're not, you know, we're not the only ones having this conversation or having thoughts about yeah. it, right? Yeah. Well, I think um, mostly it's just getting this understanding and, and making sure that everybody is on the same page. I know that there's, you know, with my dad, as well-intentioned as he is in so oh, many ways, yeah. and he would yeah. never in a million years want oh, something to gosh. happen to my son, yeah. but it just, it's one of those like, well, I mean, I'm going to be right there. He's in the backyard with me. And I'm like, he did the, did the, he's so fast. Like, it's not good enough. <laughs> so that's definitely a conversation that we will be having. And I know he thinks that I am quite strict and adamant about certain rules and safety things, but I've also worked in the nursing field for a decade Absolutely. and I have worked in eMERGE and I have seen things and yes. I have dealt with, you know, post drowning or, or near, near, you don't call it near drownings anymore, non -fatal. but non-fatal non -fatal drowning. <laughs> but I, you know, the, it's, it's beyond devastating. Like there is nothing okay about it when it is a kid. It is I, and not to like qualify it or anything, but it is so much more devastating. It really, you just, anything that is preventable, I mean, goodness, it really does take two extra seconds to do a couple of checks and you could never know that that could have been the day that something bad could have happened. Right. You know? Yeah, right. And there's different dangers with the in-ground pools versus above-ground pools. So the above-ground pool, you may, you may have a bit more time. You may not, just depending upon their access. So if there's a chair available or something like we talked about earlier, it can happen really quickly. Um, you know, we, we put up a fence when we had our seasonal pool, which we no longer have, but when we had that, we put up our fence and it was the extra cost, even though I'm not technically required by legislation, but given what I do, if something were to happen, right? I mean, I have that knowledge. And, and now that we have that knowledge, we have a responsibility to, to follow through on that. That's really important. Mm -hmm. But even, even if it's just, it could be an inflatable pool. It could be a kiddie pool. Kids are, you know, if they fall face down, it could be an inch or two of water, right? And, it, and what it is, it's, it's about aspirating on water. It's about water getting down and into the lungs, right? And so that's what we're talking about here. And kids play around. They could be, you know, they come up and they're gasping for air. And, they do, and sometimes they, they, they cough a little bit because a little bit, but if they're coughing, then that, that's closed up, right? So it, it's caught it, it's done its job, but it's when it doesn't. Or when the child has been under water for a prolonged period of time and they start to aspirate on the water and breathing it in, right? Yeah. So, and it doesn't, and it, it, it's scary stuff. And I'm not here to fear monger or anything like that. No, that's not again, what this is. Right? Yeah. Um, but you want to ensure that everything is covered up. So if you do have a backyard pool of any kind, put the cover on it. Make sure it's secure. There's, there's secure covers that are out there. Landscapers do it all the time. Um, we have... Um, uh, someone who is from uh, the uh, pool and hot tub council of Canada. Wow. That was a, a brain freeze for a moment. <laughs> and so, but, but he also installs pools. And so he was telling us about some safety elements that are available for, for pool owners that can help. In addition to fencing, there are covers that, that seal it. So it takes quite a bit to get those covers off. So that's another option, mm -hmm. but uh, yeah. Yeah. Communi communication is going to be key. Everyone's got to be on the same page and it, it can be devastating. No, I so appreciate this, Lisa. Honestly, this was filled with gold. <laughs> Oh, I'm I hope glad. that everybody here has enjoyed this as well. Um, I know lots of you have been tuning in. The replay is going to be available both here on Facebook and on YouTube, and I'll be posting it around and making sure that um, this information is available. Just share it, please, with anybody and everybody who you are going to be in contact with, who has a boat, who has a cottage, who is literally even planning on going swimming this year or not. <laughs> Share, share it, share it, share it with them. And let's hope that we have a very safe and wonderfully enjoyable summer with all of this stuff already top of mind so we don't have to worry about it. Amazing. Well, thank you again, Lisa. Thank you so, so much for coming. I really, truly appreciate it. Thank you for the invitation. Welcome to come anytime. I'm happy to and share whatever information you're looking for at any given time. And of course, uh, reach out to me if you have questions. Um, you can always reach me at lisao at lifeguarding.com. 
and uh, you know check out the uh, droning reports on lifesaving.ca under publications or get your free copy of the seventh edition of the Canadian Drowning Prevention Plan. The eighth edition is coming out this time next month. It'll be already out, but it's at uh, cdpcoalition.ca again under publications. So all kinds of free information available to anyone. And I have linked all kinds of them as we've been talking all Good. the things that you talked about. So anybody who's watching here on Facebook, you can check those out and I will attach them under the YouTube video as well. Perfect. Awesome. Thank you. Have a wonderful night, everyone, and enjoy your summer.